Good morning, year six, and happy Wednesday, or afternoon, because you might be watching this in the afternoon, but either way, happy Wednesday! Um, yes, I see you not still enjoy your third home learning video. Today we are going on to chapters five and six of Tom's Good Night Garden. We are reasoning um, in regards to decimal numbers, we're looking at adverbs, and we're looking at those pesky semicolons, which we love to hate. Here are your questions for today's chapters. You can write them down, um, pause the video obviously, write down your answers and then you'll be able to check them at the end. Here are the answers to your questions. Hope you got on with those really well today. Now we're going to do some maths and uh, we're going to start as usual with some skills practice. There are 10 questions for you to try. Just a reminder that um, if you look at number five, that's three eighths, that's a fraction uh, at two fifths, they're fractions written like that. So good luck with your skills practice today. Pause the video while you try it and then you'll be able to check your answers. Here are the answers to today's skills practice. Hope you got on well with those today. Now we're going to continue our work with decimals and fractions and in particular today we're going to apply our knowledge to some different questions. There's two things for you to think about here to get you started. Pause the video while you try them and then we'll have a think about them. Here are the answers to your questions today. Um, Pause the video while you have a look at them, but if you were finding them quite uh, tricky, it might be worth looking back at the learning video that's on the website for um, Thursday, the 2nd of April, because it looked at this work in a bit more detail. So if, if this was a problem today, go back to that one before you carry on with the rest of this lesson. So we're applying our knowledge of decimals today, here are some uh, questions for you to try. Uh, to save you copying out the whole of those um, boxes there, just, th just make a note of which number you'd put in which box. Here's some more questions for you to think about. You're going to find the odd one out in each group. Here are the answers to your questions. You'll be able to see how you got on. Hope you got on well with those. That's the end of the maths for today and Miss Tucker will be doing some spag with you next. Bye for now. Okay, okay. So today we are looking at adverbs and adverbial phrases, building on our learning from yesterday during English. So we know that adverbs and adverbials modify verbs. Adverbs being one word that modifies a verb, adverbials being a, a phrase or a collection of words that together modify the verb. So they also give us more detail about events within a sentence. So if I take a simple sentence, Miss Tucker ate her pizza, which she likes to do. I want to know how Miss Tucker ate her pizza. So ravenously, another good word for really hungry, Miss Tucker ate her pizza. This word tells me how something has happened, how I've eaten the pizza. When you say ravenously I ate the pizza, it feels like I've shoved it in my face and gobbled it up. Okay, so ravenously Miss Tucker ate her pizza. At lunchtime, Miss Tucker ate her pizza. So this is telling me when something happens. So it's telling me, um, we know that adverbs tell us the manner or the time at which something happens. Or I could have on her sofa, but I'd need to get rid of that full stop. So it can also tell us the place that something happens. Now, this example is the only of the three examples so far that is not a fronted adverbial. Remember, fronted adverbials are adverbs at the start of the sentence, split from the main clause with a comma. Whereas this one is at the end, so it's just a normal adverbial phrase. So we've got the adverb ravenously, and then the adverbial phrases at lunchtime and on the sofa 
and at lunchtime is an adverb fronted adverbial phrase because it's the start of the sentence with a comma after. Ravenously is just a fronted adverbial because it's at the start of the sentence with a comma, but it's just the one uh, word. But we know that the placements can be all over the place for these. So I could say Miss Tucker ate her pizza on a daily basis because daily allowance of pizza is very important. One pizza a day keeps the doctor away. I'm sure that's what the saying says. So that is telling me when it happens or how frequently it happens. We could have why as well. So as she was hungry, it's giving me a bit more of why I've eaten that pizza. Also an adverbial phrase. So here are some sentences. Can you point at, if you put your finger on your screen, unless it's a touchscreen computer, because then it'll mess everything up. Point at the adverb on this sentence. So the baby was born prematurely. Which word in there? It is just an adverb. It's just one word. In there tells me about the baby's birth prematurely. Nervously, he approached the first lion. Please put your finger on the adverb. It's a French adverb, clue. Nervously, he approached the fierce lion. Peter frequently watches the games at Old Trafford. Think about it. It's to do with the time. It's to do with how often something occurs. It's not a fronted adverb. Frequently. Well done. The boats made their way to the quay and anchored alongside. Think about it. Time, manner or place. Which of these words? Think about place. Where are they? They're alongside. They're alongside the quay. Daniel checks his aquarium on a daily basis. Please don't put your fish in blenders, by the way. Not safe. It's not a good thing to do. But I just thought the picture was quite funny. So, so think about time, manner or place. It's to do with time. It's to do with frequency on a daily basis. That's an adverbial phrase. He smiled confidently at the police officer. There's an adverb in here. It's to do with the manner, how something is done. Can you put your finger on it? Confidently. Okay, um, I'm really hoping this is going to work. I've got you a nice song to do with adverbs and adverbials because I know you love them all. Oh, it's going to let me do it. Yes me because you know it's all about the verb about the verb not the subject it's all about the verb about the verb not the subject it's all about the verb about the verb not the subject it's all about the verb about the verb yeah, yeah, it's pretty clear that I'm an adverb, and I can tell you, tell you, just what your verb is doing, cause I've got the information that says where and how and where and why. I'm an adverb, and this is my job, to say what the verb is doing, so please don't make it stop, cause I got the information that says where and how and where. Not that hard. 
are. And I burn my whole place down, that's where the events occur. Because you know it's all about the verb, about the verb, not the subject. It's all about the verb, about the verb, not the subject. It's all about the verb, about the verb, not the subject. It's all about the verb, about the verb. Because you know it's all about the verb, about the verb, not the subject. It's all about the verb, about the verb, not the subject. It's all about the verb, about the verb, not the subject. It's all about the verb, about the verb. Because you know it's all. Well, wasn't that a delight? If you would like to watch this uh, mini video again, it is on YouTube. Um, if you type in Grammasaurus Adverb Song, it will be there. Um, or just keep watching this bit over and over again. I'm sure you all love it. I know you all love my random spag songs. Oh. Okie dokie, so after that little musical interlude, I have got some adverb um, and adverbial phrases, questions for you. So, your first question is, there are two columns of words. You need to match the adverb to a word that it could modify. Some of the adverbs fit with two or more of the words, but you need to think which is most suitable for that adverb to go with. So pause the video, write your answers in your notebook, and then we'll whisk through the answers together on the video when you resume it. Okay, so the answers are drummed loudly. Drumming tends to be very loud. Wildly laughed, like you're a bit maniacal, a bit crazy, a wild, crazy laugh. You could slowly turn. It's a nice suspense kind of phrase there. Maybe tomorrow. And crept silently. Okay, guys, three more questions for you answer them and then we'll whisk through the answers together after you resume your video. So pause the video now. Okay, we're going to whisk through the answers. So the adverbs which indicate possibility in the first sentence are likely and certainly. So it's telling us that it's likely to rain today, so it's probably going to rain. Um, and it, the person will definitely take their umbrella with them. They will certainly. So both of those show the level of possibility in the sentence. Which word has been modified by the adverb? So read this sentence carefully. Rajpal has obviously learned his spellings as he got all of them correct on his test. We need to think, right, where's the adverb? The adverb is obviously... So which word has been modified by the adverb? Not which is the adverb, which one has been modified. So what has he obviously done? He has obviously learnt his spellings. Next up, ooh, tricky one. We have to underline the modal verbs and circle the adverbs that indicate possibility. So remember that indicating the possibility could be a certainty or a possible outcome. So the train might be late. I would certainly appreciate a lift to my audition if you don't mind. Right, so I've got might and certainly. Hmm, we know that might from yesterday is a modal verb, so it's underlined. Certainly we know is an adverb. Oh, sorry, a word is also a modal verb. Well spotted there, Miss Tucker. Certainly is an adverb. <coughs> Okay, and your last question. So have a look at these. Uh, you need to use the word obviously in the sentence below. You need to give two possible answers. Please pause the video and resume when you've written two sentences in your book. So two of the sentences that you could have would be obviously, fronted adverbial, well fronted adverb, sorry, one word. I'm not going to leave you by yourself. And you could also have it embedded in the sentence, so I'm obviously not going to leave you by yourself. 
Okay, you have got some SATs questions to have a go at. Like I said yesterday, when we were looking at SATs questions, although we're not doing our SATs, they give us a nice practice of spotting and applying our adverb skills. So please pause the video and we'll go through the answers when you are ready. Okay, so a suffix to the word light to make it an adverb. A suffix is a group of letters that go at the end of a word. So what is an adverb that has light as its root word? Lightly. The adverb in this sentence, it tells us how Jamie knocked. How did Jamie knock? Softly. The adverbial in the sentence, it's a fronted adverbial, there's a clue. Tells us when? Last week. Which one of these words is the adverb? Tick one. So the lively crowd cheered loudly when the rally car race began. So often we think about finding adverbs quickly, we look for ly words, which is a nice cheat, but it doesn't always work. So what the person who's written this sentence has done is made it really tricky. They've got two um, red herring words with an ly suffix on the end. So rally, lively, and then loudly. So one of those is correct and two are incorrect. Rally car, that is part of the noun rally car. It's a type of car, so it's, the, it's an object. It's a rally car. Lively would be an automatic choice for a lot of people. You read the second sentence, the second word, and you think, oh, there's another one word, tick. Read it carefully, the lively crowd. That's describing the crowd. The crowd are lively. They are, it, lively is describing the crowd, it's changing the crowd, not the verb. Crowd isn't a verb, crowd is a noun. So it is an adjective, not an adverb. However, the word loudly is modifying the verb cheered. And the last sentence, it is another front of the verb telling us when Felix had his dental appointment. Well done, if you got those right, they would be worth one mark each on a test. Okay, in your PDF um, booklets, you have got these three sheets. I would like you to, in your book, think of five different adverbs that describe each of the pictures. If you've printed out your PDF booklet, you can write them in. If you haven't, just make five lists in your book. So I need adverbs to describe laughed, adverbs to describe skipped, and adverbs to describe the past tense of write, which is wrote. Please, can you try and Split them up between adverbs and adverbial phrases. I'll be very impressed. So pause this sentence, uh, pause this sentence, pause this video, and then resume it when you have finished that activity and we'll move on to English. Off we go. Okay then my lovelies, so thinking back to our expanding success criteria that we created on Monday. Yesterday we looked at technical language, um, we included some formal language, although we didn't look at it in great depth. We looked at front of verbials and relative clauses, and we should have applied them in the introduction and paragraphs linked to um, different Stone Age dwellings within our information text. So today we are going to crack on with um, looking at semicolons and how they are used. One to link to main clauses and another use for them that we have looked at before in class but we will revise and we'll try and use them along with the research that you did yesterday um, in your connected curriculum to add to that information text. So we're going to build that up over the rest of the week. So first example of semicolons. Think about what are these semicolons doing in this sentence? So we've got the sentence, he used his arms and his legs to walk, semicolon. He did not walk like we do today. Another example of the same job that the semicolon is doing. This primitive creature started life 1.7 million years ago, semicolon. There was a gradual climate change across the world where weather became cooler and the human that was living had to adapt to the environment it was in. And a third one. Some people prefer tea. Some people prefer coffee. Have a think, what is the semicolon doing in each of those sentences? It's doing the same job. Pause the video and resume when you've got an answer and we'll reveal it. So let's take the tea and coffee example and look at it in a bit more detail to see what it is doing. If I look at this sentence closely, I can identify two 
main clauses. I know that they are main clauses because I've got my subject, which is some people, that's who we are talking about, and I have got my verb to prefer. Oh, this is brilliant annotations, Miss Tucker, well done. Um, so, I know that they're two independent main clauses. If I read one by itself, some people prefer T. It makes sense. If I read the other one by itself, some people prefer coffee. It makes sense. So, I've got two independent main clauses, two simple sentences that have been joined together with a semicolon. So, that semicolon there is to link, is to join together those two main clauses. This is a type of compound sentence. We've looked at compound sentences before and you've done that since year three, where you've got two main clauses joined with a conjunction. All that we've done because we're greater depth writers in year six level is swap the conjunction for a semicolon. It's less writing as well, it saves our hand, it's brilliant. Obviously you wouldn't do this for every single sentence. If you did this for every single sentence, your writing would be very monotonous because it would read like lots and lots of main um, simple sentences after the other. Some people prefer tea, some people prefer coffee. Um, some people like Coke, some people like Pepsi, some people like Twix, some people like Cadbury, okay? I think Twix is actually Cadbury, I don't know. Anyway, so it's it would be really monotonous. However, we're using this version of a compound sentence to add variety into our writing. We know that if we stick to the same type um, and structure a sentence, it gets really boring. Whereas writing is almost musical when you've got all different types of varieties intertwined with each other. So let's have a look at this sentence. Can you spot the two main clauses that have been joined together? The first one, oh, that's the second one, but we'll allow it, is he did not walk like we do today. And the first one is, he used his arms and legs to walk. And we've got that semicolon, and that is there to replace a conjunction. Okay, so here, these could be misconstrued as adverbs, but they're linking two main clauses together, so they are conjunctions. So he used his arms and legs to walk. Consequently, he did not walk like he, we do today, because we don't walk on our hands and legs. So all the semicolon is doing in these sentences is linking two main clauses together in place of a conjunction. What I would like you to do now is to write these sentences or to rewrite them, linking the two sentences together. So for each sentence, I would like you to write two new sentences. The first one I'd like you to write is where you have used a um, conjunction from the list above to create a compound sentence. And the second sentence I'd like you to write is where you've used a semicolon to create a compound sentence out of these two simple sentences. Be aware, you may not use all of those conjunctions at the top. There is one sentence in here that already has a conjunction and you can get rid of a few words and rework it in. So have a look carefully, which one don't you need an extra conjunction for? Pause the video, write these down in your notebook and then restart the video when you are ready to hear the answers. So, for answer number one, we are going to use a conjunction. So, he came to the party, however, he had to leave early. Please notice where my conjunction is, I have got a comma before it, because we still need to separate those two main clauses from each other. So, have a look through your sentences before I continue that you've got a comma in your compound sentences with conjunctions. If you're happy with that. Here it is as a compound sentence using a semicolon. He came to the party, he had to leave early. Okay, number two. I will get my suitcase. You will also need to get your suitcase. There it is as a semicolon. I will get my suitcase. Meanwhile, you will need to get your suitcase. There it is as a compound sentence with a conjunction. I am upset. You will get shouted at. I am upset, comma, therefore you will get shouted at, which is never a good reason to shout at people. It's not good to shout at people, so even if you are upset, don't shout at people, but we know that. Number four, I believe he will win. He will win because he gives great effort. Ah, this is the one with the conjunction already in, because. 
So let's see how that's been reworked. I will believe, I believe he will win. He will win because he gives great effort. That's fine. I believe he will win because he gives great effort. And Susan didn't pass her test. She will not graduate. Susan didn't pass her test. Consequently, she will not graduate, or did not graduate. Well done if you've got those right. Okay, moving on to the second reason we use a semicolon. Here are three more sentences that use semicolons. Read them carefully, pause the video, play it when you're ready and you've got a suggestion as to why these semicolons are being used. Okay, let's look at this sentence in detail. Listen carefully, colon. Hmm, why do we use colons? Oh, to introduce lists. Okay, so we've got a list. So the first item in my list is the green team led by Tom should stay by the door. That's my first one. My second item on my list is the blue team led by Joe should stand by the window. Okay. My third item is the red team should stand by the radiator and choose their leader. And the last item on my list is and the yellow team should stand by my desk. So here we've got four items in a list. I could have rewritten this as there were many teams, green team, blue team, red team and yellow team. I still use a colon to introduce my list, but in the second list, I've only got commas. Why have I only got commas in my second list and not on my first list? Think about the items in the list. What is different? The items in the first list have got extra detail in. We call them expanded items. So I'm not just saying the green team or green team. I'm adding extra detail. Because it's an expanded phrase within that list, I'm going to use a semicolon. If you look here and here, oh, that's not very bright colour, I do apologise. Um, and here and here, we've got commas in this list because they're indicating parenthesis. So if I had commas separating my list and indicating parenthesis in a sentence, that would be so confusing. So because I've got an expanded list and I need to use commas, I need to use semicolons to separate the items in the list to show that's the end of one item, that's the end of the next, that's the end of the next, because otherwise I'd get confused with these commas and these commas. So notice as well when we're using semicolons in a list, this. In a normal, short, compacted list, we don't have commas before and. Some people do. I think it's called the Oxford comma, but we don't. Um, whereas when you are using a semicolon, you do. Because I've got an and in this over here. I've got an and in this one item. A bit like the commas, I've used it in my expanded item. Whereas over here, I've got an and again. So I'd get confused between the two ands. So we use that semicolon there to show a definite break between the two items. So we use a semicolon before an and in a list in an expanded list, but we don't use a comma before an and in a normal uh, list. Happy with that? Cool. So going on to some writing. So yesterday you should have made a start with an introduction and some writing about dwellings. Today we're going to use your information that you found out about humans and how they lived in the different phases during the Stone Age to do a bit more writing and to build on that. So we're not going to forget the bits that we did yesterday. We still need to include technical language. We still need to be writing in formal language. We still need to be using fronted adverbs and adverbial phrases. We still need to be using relative clauses. But as well, I'm going to ask you to try and sneak in a semicolon. It doesn't have to introduce a list. Um, so it doesn't have to be within an expanded list. And it doesn't have to be between two main clauses. I'd like you to choose at least one. So it can be between two main clauses or it can be to introduce an expanded list. Or if you really want to push the boat out and you want to use both, that's absolutely fine as well. So you're going to build on the text that you started writing yesterday. So whether that's in your book or on your document on the computer, you're going to open that back up and you're going to add on to that. We're going to go through a little bit of a walkthrough to give you an example and then I'm going to leave you to it. 
Okay, so I'm going to give an example now of um, a text that you can magpie from or you can use as inspiration to crack on with. So, by the start of the Mesolithic period, also known as the Middle Stone Age, the only types of humans were Homo sapiens. So in there, I have one not edited very well because I'm missing a second inverted comma, but that's okay. That's what purple pen, pen is for. And I have used some parenthesis. So I've got a front of the verbial as well, which is telling me when this is happening. So when the only types of humans were, hum uh, were Homo sapiens. And I've explained that the Mesolithic period is also known as the Middle Stone Age, using parenthesis. Homo sapiens had outlived six other types of hominids that were present during the previous Paleolithic age. So, this is a relative clause because it starts with a relative pronoun that. This bit as well, if I think about my whole piece of writing, this links to a different paragraph. So, if I think about my, about my big text as a whole picture, I would have previously talked about the Paleolithic age because I'm doing mine in order. I start with the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic. So this relative clause links back to a previous paragraph. That is an example of cohesion that shows flow, that shows linking between different paragraphs. That is required for the expected writing standard. So think, have you previously read about something to do with this? Can you link it back? And it can be as simple as a relative clause at the end of a sentence, but that shows cohesion. That shows that you've thought about what you've written previously um, in your writing. We have also gotten here hyphens. We know that is an important um, element within the greater depth as well. So if you're writing um, and you're aiming for greater depth, you need to be trying to use hyphens. This topic itself is brilliant because there's so many hyphenated words. Um, it links to, uh, it lends itself to that really well. So, Homo sapiens were better able to adapt to the harsh conditions on Earth than their predecessors. Semicolon. Homo sapiens had much larger brains, brains compared to other Stone Age hominids, allowing them to invent and develop strategies to overcome their hardships. So, here is my semicolon to link two main clauses together. I could swap the semicolon for a conjunction. I could swap the semicolon for the word because. So Homo sapiens were better able to adapt to the harsh conditions on Earth than their predecessors because Homo sapiens had much larger brains compared to other Stone Age hominids. I've also then got this sentence, this, this clause, sorry, on the end. It's explaining what this does it links onto it as part of a complex sentence but this sentence then links onto my next paragraph so in this sentence i'm saying that they're allowed they have been able to overcome hardships they've developed they've invented and then i'm going to start a new paragraph and I'm going to go into that in detail and I'm going to explain that. Once again, that's the idea of cohesion. I'm linking to text that I've previously written. So in this next start of the next paragraph, it's explaining how they have invented and developed. So we've got to be constantly thinking, what have I written before? How can I link that? How can I show that this is a well thought out piece of writing? So they were able to improve their ability to hunt prey. They domesticated wolves, which helped them to hunt down wild boar. They created spear with flint tips, allowing them to hunt animals from a safe distance. And they utilised natural features such as cliffs to fence prey. It should be to fence in prey. Once again, editing is important. Even teachers do it. OK, so in this sentence, I have got a colon which introduced my list. This basically just means such as. So they were able to improve their ability to hunt prey, such as they domesticated wolves. This is a nice another relative clause because it starts the relative pronoun which, and it doesn't make sense by itself, but this bit does, and this bit links to it. I've got my semicolon to separate this expanded item and this expanded item. I've got another complex um, clause here because I'm adding bits on to this a subordinate clause and I've got another semicolon because I'm putting it between the second and the third item in my expanded list. Remember when we're using semicolons and expanded lists we put it before the last and 
unlike when we do write a compact list and we use commas. So within this writing as well, I've gone through and I've upskilled lots of words. I've been using that thesaurus thinking, what could I do instead? So instead of used natural features, I've swapped it for utilised. You've got to constantly be thinking, write a paragraph, stop, read it through. What features have, they, have you used? What could have worked better? Can you edit bits out? Have you used the best word that you could? So this then brings us to the end of our English section. I'm going to ask you to pause your video in a moment. I'm going to ask you to open up your piece of writing that you started yesterday. And I'd like you to write me three paragraphs, well, or at least three paragraphs. Here I'm just talking about the Mesolithic period and I've started a second paragraph already. So at least three paragraphs, three sections on your information text. And I would like you to tell me about humans in the Paleolithic period, humans in the Mesolithic period and humans in the Neolithic period. Try to use that semicolon if you can. Try to incorporate some fringed adverbs or adverbial phrases. Try um, to include some relative clauses, if you, especially if you didn't get any in yesterday. Um, hyphenated words lend themselves in, but also keep thinking about using those thesauruses to upskill. You can find them, remember, at thesaurus.com. That's a really good one to use. Make sure you read the sentence though to check it makes sense where it is. Other than that, happy writing. Please email me if you're stuck or would like to show off any work. I really appreciate it. Okie dokie, so that then brings us on to our connected curriculum. Like I said at the end of yesterday, you do not need to be doing anything through a connected curriculum menu if you don't have time this week, because you're doing lots and lots of research at the end of every lesson to help you with your writing, which is linked to connected curriculum. So don't worry about that. You can do if you want, um, take bits off your um, menu, or you can just leave it at this research because I know this takes quite a bit of time. But what I would like you to do for tomorrow is to research information about the different diets and methods of finding food in the Paleolithic, Mesolithic and Neolithic ages. So what did they eat and how did they find it? Um, helpful sources can also be found in the supporting PDF. So put a nice list of links that will help you as well. Happy researching. And that is it for day three, guys. Well done for cracking on. I'm very impressed with what I've seen so far. Remember the connected curriculum menu you do not have to do this week if you do not wish because you're doing connected curriculum uh, research which links into your writing. But if you've got time and you're enthused and you would like to do some, please do. And please share with me um, what you've done. I enjoy seeing it. So you've got some websites at the bottom as usual to help you. And um, there's extra learning on the BBC Bite Size website. Um, and any work that you've done, or if you're just going to give a shout out or a hello to anybody, um, please go to the Year 6 Padlet. I love seeing all the messages up there. So, happy learning, and I will speak to you all tomorrow. Bye, Year 6.